From Eyewitness News, this is Breaking News. An update now on breaking news. We first brought you on Eyewitness News this morning. The Target 12 investigators have learned former Rhode Island House Speaker Gordon Fox is being charged as part of a federal investigation. Let's go live to the U.S. Attorney's News Conference where state and federal officials are set to outline the case against Fox. Concluded an extensive grand jury investigation. We filed in federal court here in Providence a three count information charging former Rhode Island House Speaker Gordon Fox with three felonies bribery, wire fraud, and filing a false tax return. These charges stem from former Speaker Fox's substantial abuse of his campaign account to pay for his personal expenses and his solicitation and acceptance of a bribe in exchange for using his official position as Vice Chairman of the City of Providence Board of Licenses in 2008 to advocate and move for the granting of a liquor license for a Thayer Street restaurant. Also filed yesterday in federal court is a plea agreement pursuant to which, if accepted by the district court, former Speaker Fox will spend three years in federal prison. The information and plea agreement, along with a statement of facts, were unsealed by the court this morning. The allegations contained in the information and admitted to by former Speaker Fox in the signed statement of facts paint a clear picture that former Speaker Fox looted his campaign account repeatedly over a number of years to pay for plainly personal expenses and that his official appointed position as a member of the Providence Board of Licenses was for sale. Not surprisingly, he reported none of the personal income gained from stealing from his campaign accounts and accepting a $52,000 bribe on his tax returns. His corrupt conduct has resulted in his removal from high office, and deservedly so. As alleged in the information, former Speaker Fox has served in the General Assembly for many years, becoming House Majority Leader in 2002 and Speaker of the House of Representatives in 2010, holding that position until his resignation last March. Like every other candidate for elected office in Rhode Island during those years, former Speaker Fox maintained a campaign account. In his instance, Friends of Gordon Fox. Through that organization, former Speaker Fox solicited and raised money from individuals and political action committees purportedly to retain his public office and his position as Speaker. There is no dispute that under Rhode Island's election laws, such funds can only be used for that purpose, to obtain or retain public office. Rhode Island law prohibits the use of such funds to pay for personal expenses. And the rationales for that pro prohibition are, or should be, plain and obvious. When you ask people for money to support your campaign for public office and you use it for something else, you've lied to them. There is no other way to say it. You've committed fraud. And this is a particularly pernicious type of fraud and one that should concern all Rhode Islanders. Because when elected officials rely on campaign donors to maintain their personal lifestyle, there is a very real danger that they will feel a particularly strong sense of obligation to those donors. A sense of personal obligation that may cause them to act in a way more in the interest of those donors than in all Rhode Islanders. This is precisely what Speaker Fox did. He used campaign funds for personal expenses to the tune of $108,000. From February 2008, and continuing until just before the execution of the federal search warrants in March of 2014, former Speaker Fox repeatedly transferred money he had misled campaign donors into believing would be used for campaign purposes from his campaign accounts into his personal accounts. Over that approximately six-year period, he used that money, $108,000, to pay personal expenses, including the mortgage on his home, the loan payment on his car, and his personal American Express card, 
used to make purchases at such places as Tiffany's, TJ Maxx, Target, Walmart, Urban Outfitters, and the Warwick Animal Hospital. Not only did Speaker Fox mislead his campaign donors regarding what he was using their donated money for, he lied on his Rhode Island Board of, Licensed, Board of Elections filings so as to conceal his fraud. Nowhere on his Board of Elections filings did he identify the transfers out of the Friends of Fox campaign account into his personal ac accounts. As a result, his campaign filings were a fantasy. At the conclusion of 2013, his filing claimed a balance in the Friends of Fox account of $212,000, while in truth the balance in the account was roughly $52,000, as reflected on the account's actual bank statement. We discovered much of what I have just described in the wake of the execution of the search warrants in March of last year. In the course of following the money trail, which required a tremendous amount of work on the part of the prosecutors, agents, and detectives who stand before you today, we discovered that in 2008, former Speaker Fox accepted a $52,000 bribe while serving as an appointed member of the Providence Board of Licenses. As alleged in the information, in 2008, the Shark Sushi Bar and Grill, a new restaurant on Thayer Street in Providence, applied for a liquor license from the City of Providence Board of Licenses. Former Speaker Fox was, at that time, Vice Chairman of the Board of Licenses and House Majority Leader. The Shark Bar's application for a license was not without controversy. To the contrary, there was considerable neighborhood opposition to the application. As alleged in the information, in the face of that opposition, one of the shark, shark Bar partners told another that in exchange for money, then Vice Chairman Fox would, in his official capacity, help the Shark Bar obtain a liquor license. Then Board Vice Chairman Fox met with the two Shark Bar partners in August of 2008. As a result of this meeting, Board Vice Chairman Fox agreed to accept a bribe in exchange for supporting and advocating in favor of the Shark Bar application before the Board. Vice Chairman Fox followed through on his corrupt promise. At a Board of Licenses hearing on August 13, 2008, the two Shark Bar partners testified in favor of their application, and members of the public voiced their opposition. The Board took the application under advisement. At a subsequent Board hearing on August 29, 2008, Vice Chairman Fox, pursuant to his corrupt agreement with the Shark Bar partners, spoke in detail regarding why the license should be granted and move the board to approve the Shark Bar's application. The board voted to approve the application. With their liquor license now in hand, the two Shark Bar partners delivered $32,000 in cash and checks to board Vice Chairman Fox. A third silent Shark Bar partner delivered an additional $17,500 to Vice Chairman Fox through one of the other Shark Bar partners. In all, Vice Chairman Fox accepted a $52,000 bribe in exchange for his official action as then Vice Chairman of the Providence Board of Licenses on behalf of the Shark Bar. When the federal search warrants in this case were executed nearly a year ago, there was talk about the State House being the People's House. I agree completely. The People's House should be occupied by elected officials who hold office to serve the people, not themselves. As federal and state prosecutors and federal and state law enforcement officials, we represent the people of the United States and the people of Rhode Island. And we will go anywhere, anywhere we can lawfully go to obtain the evidence we need to protect their interests. Since I have been U.S. Attorney, just in federal court alone, we have, convict we have convicted three town councilmen, a mayor, a state senator, and the deputy speaker of the House of Representatives. Now the speaker of the House of Representatives stands before the federal court. Attorney General Kilmartin could give you his own list. As Rhode Islanders, we need to lose our political corruption amnesia. In general, I believe in rehabilitation and second chances. But I do not believe that those who have sworn to uphold the public trust and violated it and be given the enormous opportunity 
and privileged to serve the public and abused it should ever be given that opportunity again. I believe that those who are paid to play in Rhode Island should never be given the opportunity to play again. I believe that companies that have received enormous public contracts and intentionally or negligently failed to perform as required should never be given an opportunity to receive those contracts again. If we are serious about ending public corruption, really serious about it, we can do it. But it requires a real change in the way we do business. The good people of Rhode Island who have lived here all their lives or who, adjo or who arrived just last week are not getting what they deserve. And once and for all, that has to change. There are many people to thank in this case. As always, it begins with the people who did the work on the ground. And they are Assistant United States Attorney Dulce Donovan, Assistant U.S. Attorney Adie Goldstein, Assistant Attorney General Patrick Youngs, the prosecutors who work side by side with the detectives and agents to break this case down, pull it apart, and build it from the ground up. It really was just a superlative job by those line prosecutors. The agents in this case, many of them familiar to you uh, from their past work on cases like this, again, were just superlative. FBI Special Agent Jim Picavage, who seems to be involved in every corruption case this office does, including some I did years ago, again, was just brilliant in his work. IRS Special Agent Troy Nero, uh, again, involved in many of our cases, uh, broke down the accounts involved in this case and really painted a clear picture, one I've tried to deliver to you this morning. And equally important to the effort, Rhode Island State Police Sergeant Bob Kramer and Detective Jim Brown uh, worked with the agents to build the case uh, that we hope to put before the court later this morning. I want to thank FBI Special Agent in Charge Vince Lisi for his commitment to the people of Rhode Island. I also want to thank Colonel Stephen O'Donnell. Time after time, the state police have worked with this office to build some of our most impactful cases. I also want to thank IRS Special Agent in Charge William Orford for the IRS's outstanding work in this case and in so many of the other major cases we have brought over the past few years. The fact is, if I think of the cases that we have brought in the five plus years I've been U.S. Attorney, every major case that we've done has involved the IRS as a true and valued partner. Nobody tears a case apart, a financial case apart, the way the IRS does. And I'm so pleased to partner with them again today. And finally, I want to thank Attorney General Kilmartin for his partnership in this case. We've acted in concert in a whole host of cases and initiatives over the past years with great success. This case represents the pinnacle of that cooperative effort. Without the Attorney General's support and his willingness to proceed with state charges if necessary, we would not be here today. Because the fact is that the bribery charge that I've laid out for you could not have been brought in federal court because of the passage of the statute of limitations. And so, as a result, uh, the Attorney General's office and this office partnered again to reach what I believe is a great result for the people of Rhode Island. So, Attorney General Cromartin, thanks so much for your support and assistance. This was truly a team effort. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Good morning. As we stand here today to announce the plea agreement with former Speaker Farks, it brings to close yet another sad chapter for Rhode Island politics. Just as the cynics can look at this case as one more example of pro public corruption in Rhode Island, they should also recognize the law enforcement and prosecutorial officials many of us standing up here today and have confidence that public corruption will not be tolerated in the state of Rhode Island and will be prosecuted. It won't be tolerated by me personally, 
by the U.S. Attorney, our staffs, or the staffs of everyone here. Working together, law enforcement at every level, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the FBI, the IRS, the State Police, the Department of Attorney General, we continue to follow the leads, follow the evidence, build a strong case, no matter where the evidence takes us, no matter how high the office, no matter how powerful the individual. That is something Rhode Islanders can trust in, and that is what occurred in this case. Last March, when the federal case began against Mr. Fox, I pledged to U.S. Attorney Narona the support and resources of the Department of Attorney General should they become necessary in what began as a federal case. As the investigation unfolded, when the evidence of the bribery was discovered, Mr. Narona and I had a discussion as to how to best to proceed. As he stated, the federal statute of limitations had expired. The state statute of limitations had not. The state possessed the prosecutorial tools necessary to go forward with this specific charge. And the state was prepared to go forward with that charge. Utilizing that dynamic, I believe it was the threat of the state prosecution of the bribery that led Gordon Fox to waive the statute of limitations on the federal side and plead to the bribery count in the federal information. It was that information uncovered through the good work of all of these individuals and some others not standing here during that investigation that we all had the ability to move forward with that information today and secure a just resolution. The close working relationship between the Department of Attorney General and the U.S. Attorney's Office allows both of us to leverage our state and federal resources against those who violate our laws and the public's trust to ensure that justice I just referenced. Again, this is a perfect example of that dynamic. And I finally want to re strongly reemphasize what Mr. Narona and I have already stated. Corruption in any form but especially political corruption, will not be tolerated by either the Department of Attorney General, nor the U.S. Attorney's Office, nor any of our partners here today. Working individually or in concert, and working through law enforcement investigators, we will be aggressive in rooting out corruption, prosecuting those who violate the trust that the citizens of the state of Rhode Island have placed in them, and we will bring it to whatever rightful conclusion there should be. I want to especially commend and thank Assistant Attorney General Patrick Youngs, Assistant U.S. Attorney Dulcie Donovan for their efforts in this case, as well as all of those partners uh, who you all know now. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Vincent Lissy. I'm the special agent in charge of the uh, Boston Division of the FBI. First, I want to thank these people here. Uh, they're the reason this happens. Uh, the, the hard work that they put forward is uh, truly commendable. I got to tell you, it's quite an honor and a privilege to be able to stand here and represent the men and women of the FBI who are really dedicated to combating public corruption. The U.S. Attorney uh, hit the nail on the head when he was talking about, we find ourselves here way too often talking about corrupt public officials in Rhode Island. Um, I, you know, I scratch my head, and it's troubling and very concerning that we keep finding ourselves back here with these officials. And, you know, I'm not sure if it is uh, these officials are overcome with greed or that uh, maybe it's arrogance that they think they can get away with this, or maybe a combination of uh, both as to why we keep finding ourselves here. But what really befuddles me is that they haven't realized we're not going away, right? If you are a corrupt public official, just like the Attorney General said, you know, the boys in the band are going to get back together and we're going to come and we're going to get you, track you down, and then make sure you're brought to justice. So, thank you very much.
Good morning, everyone. My name is William Offord. I'm the special agent in charge, IRS Criminal Investigation Division for covering New England. Uh, I would like to thank United States Attorney Narona and our law enforcement partners for their support of the IRS mission. Gordon Fox abused his power as House Speaker and betrayed the public's trust. He accepted bribes, diverted campaign funds for personal use, and failed to report any of this on his federal income tax returns. Investigating public corruption is one of IRS criminal investigations' highest priorities, and our full financial investigations are a powerful tool in rooting out corruption and other financial crimes. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Colonel Steve O'Donnell from the Rhode Island State Police. On March 14, 2014, members of the Rhode Island State Police Financial Crimes Unit and Uniform Bureau assisted the execution of two search warrants at the office and home of former Speaker Gordon Fox, along with the U.S. Attorney's Office, their attorneys, the IRS, as well as the State Attorney General's Office. All documents seized were turned over to the U.S. Attorney's Office and the FBI and the IRS for review. As a result of the review of the records obtained through search warrants and interviews of the donors to former Speaker Fox's campaign, there was specific evidence to support the investigation that was ongoing prior to the execution of the search warrants. Those campaign funds, campaign funds were being used for the former speaker's personal expenses. The Rhode Island State Police worked with the U.S. Attorney's Office, the top Department Attorney General, the FBI, the IRS, to conduct numerous interviews related to campaign contributions to Speaker Fox, Fox's campaign. During the investigation and examination of bank records, Again, by the team I mentioned behind me, it was learned in August of 2008, former Speaker Fox, who was the vice chairman of the Providence Licensing Board, received a bribe from two businessmen. Speaker Fox's role in the board, on the board was to process a range of license applications and license violations for the city of Providence, including, among other items, liquor licenses. His duties included, but were not limited to, hearing testimony related to liquor license applications, violations, and votings on whether to approve liquor license applications. Mr. Fox accepted money in exchange for taking official action as the vice chairman of this licensing board by supporting, advocating, and voting in favor of the business license application. Former Speaker Fox also diverted money from his Friends of Gordon Fox campaign account for prohibited personal expenses knowingly with intent to defraud. He also filed a fraudulent income tax return. I want to commend our United States Attorney's Office under the leadership of Peter Narona, his talented team of assistant U.S. attorneys, as well as Peter Kilmartin's team and Peter's leadership on this, of, again, assistant U.S. US and AG's their talented team. The FBI, you've already talked to and heard from um, SAC, our special agent in charge, Vince Lisi, but his team put together members of the Bureau, including the lead, Jim Pitzkavich. And I do want to commend Jim. And uh, in the back there, our um, special agent in charge, Liz Rosado, for their leadership on this. I also want to mention, and I think it, it bears mentioning the IRS, the SAC, Bill Offord, and Special Agent Troy Nero, who really pushed this case forward. Lastly, I want to con congratulate our Sergeant, Robbie Kramer, who is the officer in charge of our Financial Crimes Unit, and James Brown who work together seamlessly to bring Mr. Fox to justice. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, yes, Tim. In order for uh, someone to accept the bribe, mm -hmm. have to pay one. Sure. So why wasn't that end? Why wasn't anything charged from that end? Right. Is that still under Yeah, well, that's still under review, Tim. You know, one of the things I think the Attorney General and I have tried to make clear is that, you know, this was something, um, uh, as alleged in the information that we uncovered as we were looking at the campaign finance side of the case. And uh, by the time we discovered that, the federal statute had passed. And so whether or not others should or shouldn't be charged is something that's under review. Uh, you know, every case is different. I think all of you know from prior statements that I've made that uh, I view both sides of the transaction as be problematic. I made the, the comment I made earlier about paying to play. I think it's uh, certainly something we need to take a look at. Peter, when did this investigation start and how did it get started? Yeah, you know, I can't get in all the, um, the details of that, Ian, but I think it's a good example. Um, and I really have to, you know, uh, Dulcie Donovan and Jim Pickavage and Troy Nero and, and, and Bob Kramer and Jim Brown, um, you know, really built this case by looking here and finding something here that took them there 
and looking there and then finding something that took them there. And I can't get into all the details as to as sort of what A, B, and C were. Um, but, you know, this was not a case where uh, we had an informant and someone wore a wire and it was fairly quickly put together. Not that those cases aren't difficult to make, but this was a really difficult get into the documents, uh, look, get into the accounts, and really build a kind of case. And so people ask, you know, gosh, you know, people would ask me, of course, I would never answer. Some of you asked me, you know, what's going on? And, of course, you know I never tell you. Um, but one of the reasons cases like this take time is because it takes time to get through all that material. Um, and when you go through the material in painstaking fashion the way these guys did, um, you tend to, to find things that are worth following up on. So, you know, they really deserve the credit um, and for the hard work. Uh, this, is not, this is not a case that came to them. They had to go out and find it, and I give them a lot of credit. Just a quick follow. What was found during the March 20th raid that revealed the 56000 well, I'll only say that, uh, without getting into the specifics, that records that were obtained uh, led us to look at other transactions and simply following up on that, that in that sea of transactions, uh, we found the bribe. Um, but, but think about that for a minute. Think about how many transactions you have to look at and follow up on to find that. I mean, that's not something you find in a day or two days. You find that in weeks and months. And you find it in weeks and months by working really hard in those weeks and months. So. While there was a lot of, you know, you know we, we, we hear, you know, we hear from family, friends, our own department, from me, the prosecutors hear from me, where are we? The reason why these cases take time is because it requires that level of deep dive in a case like this. Michelle? Yeah, um, you said that his campaign account showed a, uh, on his filings it showed about $250,000 worth of bribes. Mm -hmm. Is there some missing money there? Right. Right, doesn't add up to that delta, correct? Yeah. No, it's a good point. And one of the issues that you have when you go back and looking at bank records is you can only go so far back in time. And we were able to identify, as alleged in the information, that amount. Um, and, and the difference may be explained in a lot of ways, but we're very comfortable, as alleged in the information, with that dollar amount. But in terms of tracking accounts and transactions in and out of bank accounts, you can only go back a certain distance. So could there be any? Yeah, I don't want to speculate, Michelle. I want to stick to the facts as, as we know them. But it's a, it's a good question. Tell us how the story started, a complaint, uh, an aberration on paperwork, speculation among your staff. How did it start? How sure, did Gene. Yeah, so, you know, uh, without getting into specifics, the way these things happen is, uh, you know, we may read a press account. Uh, we may get a complaint from an agency, a federal agency or state agency, and you follow up. And as I said, you may send subpoenas out, and those subpoenas will give you insight into X. And as looking at the records in X, it may take you to Y, and then you may look at Y, and it takes you to Z. And that's not uncommon. It, it's, why, um, it's why sometimes, as I said, these cases, you know, can take a long time. And, and our cases come in from all different kinds of sources. Sometimes they come in that way. Sometimes someone will make a complaint and will follow up on it. What's the case back in this case? I, I, can, I, can, I can only say, Gene, that it was as a result of another investigation, which I can't identify, um, and that, again, it was following a paper trail, which these guys really did an outstanding job on. But this dates back to 2008. We all know that there are more contemporary examples of concerns about Mr. Fox and his campaign spending account mm -hmm. recently than just a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Did you find anything more current that, that still bears investigation, or is this well, if yeah. Well, well, no. If you look, if you look at these, if you look at the information, I recognize you're just getting it now. It does cover a time period between 2008 and March of 2014. So the period in question where there was the diversion uh, of funds from the campaign account to the personal accounts occurred over that period of time between 2008 uh, and 2014. So it's not limited to 2008. You follow it? Yeah, but uh, I, I go back to this example where he was cited by the ethics. Yeah, I mean, you know, we looked at what we looked at and we covered the years in question, as I said, from 28 all the way through 2014. When you talk about that bribery charge being specific to 2008, so many businesses have come before the license court mm -hmm. during these past few years. Should it be the same approach or look at anybody who got illegal license? Well, you know, um, you're an investigative reporter, right? I'm sure you'll, you'll do whatever you think you need to do. You know, we follow the evidence where it takes us. And, you know, um, I can tell you the work that's done here is exhaustive. Uh, as I said, you know, if you're not, this was not a case that was easy to find. 
okay? And so uh, these guys worked really, really hard to find it and uh, really grateful uh, to them for, for putting that kind of effort into it. Yes, sir? The people who gave the bribe, did they right. cooperate with you in identifying this money as a bribe? You know, I don't want to get into sort of what individuals in, in cases did or didn't do. Uh, you know, uh, there's, there's still work that needs to be done. Um, or may need to work, may need to be done. So I don't want to get in, get into those specifics. Looking ahead to later today, he's in court. He's going to plead guilty. Will he be remanded into custody right away? What happens? Oh, there's a lot of steps, you know, uh, left to take. I'll let the court proceedings play themselves out. You know, we're here to announce the information is charged, the plea agreement is filed. The court still has to accept the plea agreement. Um, you know, so we'll see where things go from here. Why was it? Ed? You, you talked about how often you've been here with other officials I think, you know what, I, th I think it's culture. I, I think we keep coming back to the same thing. Um, I think uh, there are instances where uh, public officials, whether it be something in their public life or, um, you know, they're charged and convicted of something in their personal life, you know, tax fraud, bank fraud. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be this notion that, um, you know, this is something which um, it should cause us to take notice. Um, you know, should we be having, you know, sort of send-offs on the night before they go to prison? I mean, does, it, does that does that make sense? Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I said about the political corruption amnesia. You know, you can have someone who's violated the public trust and they're back running for office again eight years later. You know, the public, we, ha we have to recognize, you know, I, as I said, I believe in second chances and rehabilitation. We do a lot of work with a lot of partners on that very issue. Um, but when you violate the public trust, you shouldn't get a second chance. That's one place where you shouldn't get one. I mean, it's an incredible privilege to serve the people. I mean, I know that these guys, and when I was an assistant U.S. attorney, when I went into that courtroom and I said I represented the people of the United States, that's an incredible privilege, uh, whether you're a prosecutor or you're a member of law enforcement. So our public officials should look at it the same way. It's a privilege, not a right. And you should serve the people and not yourselves. And the public should expect that from their public officials. Can you talk more about where he spent the money? I heard there were extensive renovations at his former home. Any idea where the money was spent? You know, not more than what's in the information at this point. Parker, I haven't come to you yet. Peter, in terms of the overall investigation, can we be clear, are, are we done here, or should other city officials or state officials be on notice as this thing develops further? Well, you know, I don't want to build up or, or tamp down expectations, but, but know this, that, you know, it should be plain if it isn't already, that everyone up here uh, is laser focused on corruption for obvious reasons we need to be. So we'll go where the evidence takes us. If, if we're looking at this and it takes us there, then we're going to go there. If it means going to the State House to execute a search warrant, I'm sorry, the place isn't off limits. If that's where we need to go, that's where we're going to go. One more question. Tim? Um, why wasn't an arrest warrant issued for George Bosch? Mm -hmm. People might think of playing field right. at this level. You know, the yeah. be taken into custody. Yeah. What is the process now? Is he being booked as we speak? You know, I, I, can't, I can't speak to that, Tim. But I, the, the process, at least in federal court, routinely works this way. Mayor Moreau was, was treated precisely the same way. Unless we have a reason. A politician, well, I get that. But unless, well, it's true of white collar uh, defendants too. Unless there's either an escape risk issue or a danger issue, uh, then we typically allow defendants to turn themselves in. It doesn't matter whether you're a politician or a white collar defendant. On the other hand, if you've been involved in violent crime and we're concerned, you know, about the person either fleeing um, or committing a violent crime, we might treat it differently. But this is not unusual. And I can assure you that we don't treat politicians any differently than we treat anyone else. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. So those were members of the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Rhode Island Attorney General's Office, the FBI, the IRS, and state police. Again, former House Speaker Gordon Fox has been charged with bribery, wire fraud, and filing a false tax return. Earlier this morning, WPRI.com reporter Dan McGowan spoke exclusively with Gordon Fox as he was leaving his East Providence home. Fox confirmed for us at the time that he'll be in court later today. Gordon, can you tell us anything? Yeah, but I mean, can, can you say, I, you know, obviously we're expecting a lot. Can you say anything at all? No, at this point, you know, it's still a process you got to go through. And the first opportunity I get to talk to all of you, you know I will. Are well. you going to be able to talk to us today at all? Probably not. Are you, you going to, you, you are going to appear in court today, correct? Um, that's the plan. That's the plan. Okay. Okay.
All right, I'm sorry to get Do you want to say right. anything to taxpayers, the voters of Rhode Island? Can't say anything now, and you know the difficult position is when you're yeah. dealing with a legal proceeding. Sure. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Glenn. We'll, of course, be covering every aspect of this story throughout the day, tracking the details of this investigation. Again, we're also expecting Fox to appear in court later today. We're hearing that he will appear in court at noon. We'll also bring you the latest reaction from lawmakers as this breaking news story unfolds. Be sure to watch Eyewitness News at noon here on WPRI 12 and tonight starting live at 5 for all of the latest developments. And, of course, the latest on this breaking news 24-7. Just head to our website, WPRI.com. For more on this breaking story, stay with Eyewitness News or log on to our website, WPRI.com.